society, state policy, regional challenges, and individual rights. The event will take place, but because of some visa issues and passport issues, two of the Russian participants uh, will not be able to participate. But we, one will, um, uh, Alexei Malashenko from the Carnegie Moscow Center will be speaking, and Alexander Bogomolov, who is president of the Association of Middle Eastern Studies of Ukraine. So the event will take place, and we have two very interesting speakers, just not the speakers who were announced in, in the program. Um, it is uh, really a great pleasure to be hosting uh, a two-day meeting with our colleagues at SSRC on HIV AIDS in Eurasia. And you'll be hearing uh, from some of the people participating in that panel, but we have a special treat to start us off. Uh, Senator Bob Bennett is going to speak. And he uh, was elected to his third term in the Senate in 2004. He is Chief Deputy Majority Whip and a member of the uh, Senate Republican leadership team. He joins uh, Senate Majority Leader Bill First and uh, Majority Whip Mitch McConnell in managing strategy and, and scheduling in the Republican-led Senate. He is also Vice Chairman of the Joint Economic Committee and a senior member of the Senate Banking Committee. Uh, and is on this Senate Appropriations Committee, where he sub, uh, chairs the Subcommittee on Agriculture. He uh, has been very much involved in uh, Homeland Security. He's on the Senate Homeland Security and Governmental Affairs Committee and the Senate Rules Committee. And he was named uh, by Congressional Quarterly Magazine as Emerging Leader in post-September 11th Senate. Um, all of this speaks to his political career and political credentials, but of course, before you become a senator, uh, you have a career as well and a successful career. In uh, Senator Bennett's case, he uh, earned distinction in entrepreneurial and government activities. He was a chief executive officer of the Franklin International Institute, and he was named uh, by Incorporated Magazine as uh, Entrepreneur of the Year for the Rocky Mountain region. He also worked as chief congressional liaison with the U.S. Department of Transportation. He's a native of Salt Lake City, and he's the son of former four-term four Senator uh, Wallace Bennett and Francis Grant Bennett. And uh, he graduated and was former student body president at the University of Utah. Uh, so with all of that, I'm going to turn the floor over to him right now. Thank you. Do you want me up there or down here? Wherever you're most comfortable. <clears throat> Well, why don't I sit down? <laughs> Be a little, a little bit uh, less pontifical if I'm sitting down and, and visiting with you. And uh, I'm, I'm delighted to be here. I'm honored that you would ask me. I'm not quite sure how much I can add to uh, your dialogue, but I'll do my best. Uh, Judy Twigg, who, who uh, was responsible for getting me interested in the subject of health in Russia, was one of the scholars that spoke to an Aspen Institute conference. I go to as many Aspen Institute conferences as I can because they're a fountain of information and uh, very lively discussion. There's one other assignment that I have that uh, didn't get into the biography. I'm chairman of the Transatlantic Policy Network, which is a group of European parliamentarians, members of the European Parliament, and um, American congressmen and companies, CEOs or other high-level officials that do business in the transatlantic relationship. People like Daimler Chrysler and uh, uh, Citicorp and IBM and Ford and people like that that have businesses on both sides of the Atlantic and view it really as a basically a single marketplace. And as the chairman of that network, and the net, the, the uh, effective word is network. We don't have a big headquarters. We don't have a bunch of scholars. We don't uh, turn out a bunch of papers. We get together and network. And we have a meeting every year in Brussels and another one uh, in the United States. Shortly after I became the chairman, for some unexplainable reason, the U.S. meeting was held in Salt Lake City. But 
Um, <laughs> we, we get together, it's funded by the European Parliament appropriations money uh, and then foundations, the German Marshall Fund and dues paid by the companies. So that keeps me involved in European affairs and uh, is a supplement to what I get at the Aspen Institute. I do sit as a member of the um, uh, State Foreign Operations Subcommittee of the Appropriations Committee, and that is the subcommittee that appropriates all of the money for foreign assistance. So I get involved in the AIDS issue and uh, international health care issues from that vantage point. So with that um, background, let me talk briefly about what I see happening vis-a-vis -vis Russia and Central Europe and then respond to any questions that you might have. Uh, <clears throat> the basic framework for what we're doing as a nation in Russia is the Freedom Support Act that was passed before I came to the Congress. That was in 1992 when I was campaigning. And that year, after a uh, very uh, significant and often fractious debate, Congress passed the act authorizing U.S. foreign assistance to Russia and to the other countries of the former Soviet Union. Now, the act authorized the assistance, but the assistance focuses in three areas. Facilitating the transition from authoritarianism to democracy is the number one thing. We, we will give you money that will help you make that transition. Uh, the importance of that was brought home to me when I was in Russia talking to a member of the Duma about a, a different issue. And as we were exploring this, and I was being as gentle as I could about Russia's failure to, uh, to live up to its potential in this area, he said, Senator, you have to understand there's nothing malicious about our inability to get this done. There's no conspiracy here. We're just not very good at it. Uh, democracy is a new experience for us. <laughs> we don't quite know how to react. And what you see as intransigence is basically nothing more than fundamental incompetence. And uh, that was, frankly, a little bit comforting. <laughs> If you go back in American history, we have plenty of examples of incompetence in our own inability to establish democracy and make it work, and uh, the Russians are having the same kinds of problems. But that was number one in the act, the transition from authoritarianism to democracy, and that's why we gave them foreign aid. Number two is uh, promoting the introduction and growth of free market economies. Uh, I know there are a lot of ideologues who say, oh, you're, you Republicans are just interested in money. <laughs> and we are interested in higher things. We pay attention to more basic issues than the economy. And of course, if you read Grisham's books, The Pelican Brief, uh, it pits the birds and the natural things against money and all the rest of this. A very, very fundamental way to solve health problems and cultural problems is to make the people prosperous. I have come to the conclusion that the economy is the base of everything else. And if your government isn't presiding over a vigorous economy, there is no money for environmental protection and scrubbers on your on your factories. There is no money for military if you're trying to establish security. If the economy doesn't work, there's no money for health care for the poor. There's no money for any of these kinds of things. So that was the second focus, promoting the introduction and growth of free market economies. Uh, you can look across the world a little bit at China. The Chinese have made a very interesting social contract with their people. As long as the economy continues to grow and the people's economic status continues to get better, the people will tolerate their illegitimate government. And it is an illegitimate government, and it is a totalitarian government. But they are buying off any kind of internal dissension with uh, improving economic conditions. 
And of course, the Soviet Union was exactly the reverse. Economic conditions kept getting worse and worse. And the only place that continues to survive with economic conditions getting worse and worse and the totalitarian government not being overthrown is North Korea. And of course, North Korea is a surreal world, and we won't take the time to go into that, but uh, that's, that's different. Then third was increasing security, primarily through controlling the proliferation of uh, WMD and the dismantling of Russia's nuclear capability. And that is going on as the Russian nukes are coming into the United States and the nuclear power is being decommissioned. I've been told, uh, I was stunned to learn this, that uh, the uranium that goes into America's nuclear electric, uh, electricity generation, 40% of the uranium that is available to the nuclear plants along the East Coast comes from the decommissioning of Russian weapons. So uh, that, that's working pretty well. All right, so these are the three issues. Facilitating transition to democracy, promoting free market economy, and decommissioning nuclear weapons. So you say, okay, that's fine, but where's the aid for tuberculosis and AIDS and other health care issues, which are uh, approaching, uh, if Judith, Judy can give you the, the, the full information, uh, but they, they approach epidemic levels in Russia. It's not something that the outside world can impose upon the Russians. One of the areas where they have the greatest difficulty is in their prisons. And uh, you put, cram people together in prisons where there is inadequate amount of space for each individual prisoner, and then introduce a highly contagious disease like tuberculosis into the prison by virtue of prisoners who have it, and you virtually guarantee an incubation for an epidemic because the prisoners eventually get out and take that out into the, uh, the general populace. And AIDS and tuberculosis are uh, major, major problems in Russia. The problem that we now have, shifting from that view of things in 1992, is that 15 years later, uh, Russia is a very different place, primarily because of oil at $60 a barrel. Interestingly enough, Russia is turning into a petrostate. When we talk about a petrostate, we usually think of Saudi Arabia and Kuwait and, and countries like that where Oil is a two-edged sword. On the one hand, it's wonderful to have that kind of oil revenue, particularly in Saudi Arabia where your list lifting cost, that is what it costs you to get the oil out of the ground, your lifting cost is about a dollar and a half a barrel and you can sell it for $60. That's a pretty good deal. The other side of the coin is when you're in that kind of an economy, you don't develop anything else because you figure you don't need it. I remember the historian who said the British were enormously fortunate when they came to the Western Hemisphere because they didn't find gold. And the Spanish did. And that's the difference between the British colonies, subsequently North America, and the Spanish colonies, South America. The Spanish just loaded all the golds on, on ships and took it back. The British colonies had to plant fields and raise wheat and in Virginia tobacco, and start manufacturers. They had to create a functioning overall economy and the Spanish just took the gold. That paradigm applies to petro states around the world and the Soviet, the Russia has now become a petrostate. And as they begin to flex their geopolitical muscles around the region by virtue of their 
oil and gas revenues, they begin to create all kinds of instability. The last time I was in Europe, uh, in Brussels, the uh, European politicians with whom I normally deal all came up to me and the, the first thing they said was, the war over the war is over. Now that, you know, what, what do you mean? They said, we don't want to talk about Iraq. We don't want to argue about Iraq. The war over the war is over. The Russians cut off the pipeline to Ukraine in the middle of the winter and 40% of our natural gas comes through that same pipeline to Europe and if they should cut that off to us, it would destroy the European economy. That's what we want to talk about. We don't want to talk about Iraq. Forget Iraq. You, know, you, you go ahead to Iraq. You do whatever you want in Iraq. We, we got a real problem. <laughs> and the other thing that comes out of the European discussions is a growing sense of apprehension that uh, Mr. Putin is moving back towards authoritarianism. And if the number one focus of U.S. assistance coming out of the 1992 act was to facilitate the transition from authoritarian to democr authoritarianism to democracy, and that trend is now going back the other way, that has all kinds of implications as to what we will do in the Foreign Ops Subcommittee of Approps in terms of uh, appropriating money for this kind of thing. Now, you're not just interested in Russia. I understand you're interested in Central Europe. Those Central European countries that have now gotten out from under the domination of the old Soviet Union are desperately looking to the United States to keep them free. Uh, a group of us went to Georgia, and the first thing the president of Georgia said as he walked into the room to greet us was, if it weren't for America's position in the world, where would we be? And uh, none of this, we don't want American interfering with our affairs. It was, we exist because you stand as the, the bulwark of freedom around the world and we're very grateful. We got the same kind of reaction when we went to Ukraine and of course the, the new Prime Minister of Ukraine addressed a joint session of Congress a month or so ago and, uh, and made the same point. Great tension in that part of the world, political tension and the casualty always of this kind of political, content, uh, political tension is the internal infrastructure problems. The more Mr. Putin focuses on his geopolitical activities and his use of the pipeline and his use of petrodollars to further his uh, political aims abroad, the less attention he pays to the potential of a significant epidemic within his own country. And one other point, and I'll, I'll be through and respond to your questions. The more I look at the world, the more convinced I become that the one area that, uh, of study that gets ignored to our peril is demographics. And if you look around the world, you see that there are major demographic shifts that are in the works. And of all the things, that all the trends, that one has to deal with in thinking about the world, demographics is the trend that is the most difficult to change. Once a demographic sets in, demographic trend sets in, it stays for a long, long time. And the demographic trend in Europe right now is shrinking populations. Here are the numbers to uh, conjure with replacement rate in other words, for a population to remain stable in size, you have to have 2.1 births per woman just to keep the population stable. Birth rate in Russia is 1.3. Birth rate in Italy is 1.3. Birth rate in Germany is 1.7. Birth rate in the United States is 2.0. We don't have enough to 
keep our population at its present size, but we continue to grow. How does that be? Well, the answer to that is immigration. And the, uh, the birth rate within the country is 2.0, but the extra 0.1 is more than made up, of, made up for by the immigrants who come into the country and add to the population. So if Europe is going to keep from getting into a demographic death spiral where they end up with nothing but old people, they're going to have to resolve their immigration problem, and their immigration problem is a, an ethnic and cultural one because most of the immigrants who come into Europe are Muslim. And they do not assimilate into the European population the way American America assimilates its immigrants. And you end up with the French riots in the Muslim sector of Paris, as an example. All right. In Russia, there's not a lot of immigration. There are not a lot of folks who want to live in Russia. There are not a lot of people lining up at the embassy to get a, a visa to go to Russia to settle. Uh, unlike, interestingly enough, Iran. Iran is, uh, in terms of its populace, probably the most pro-American country in the world, even though their government is probably the most anti-American uh, government in the world. And in order to get a visa to come to America, if you're an Iranian, you have to go to Dubai. And the line around the American consulate in Dubai of Iranians trying to get to this country is very, very long. But that's not true of anybody trying to go to Russia. So the demographics say that if they cannot do something about their birthright, Russia will shrink from its present roughly 140 million people down to 80 million people in, what, 30 years, 40 years? You can't be quite sure of those dates, but somewhere in that horizon, certainly within the lifetimes of the people in this room, I hope including me, um, Russia will see its population almost cut in half. And that is exacerbated by the, uh, shrink the shrinking life expectancy because of their health care epidemics. This is a major, major problem. Will affect all kinds of things. And so far, Mr. Putin is trying to deal with it by offering Russian women a cash payment if they will have children. Um, I'm not sure that's going to work. On that happy assessment of things in Russia, let me respond to any questions that you might have, or let me sit here and listen to other members of the panel if you're sick of hearing of me. Okay, the senator uh, has about a half an hour before he's going to have to go, so let's see if there are any questions or comments or observations first before I introduce the rest of the panelists. Um, one of the, I have, I guess it's more of an observation. Um, it was very interesting that you, you brought in immigration and demographic decline because uh, two months ago, the UN um, identified the largest immigration countries in the world, and the United States was first. And I'm going to explain the numbers in a second, but Russia was second, Germany was third, and Ukraine was Russia fourth. Russia was second, so I'm wrong. All and right. the re there it will not be the first time. There, there, but there are interesting reasons for this. Part of it has to do with people being foreign-born. So what you have in the Russian case and the Ukrainian case are large numbers of people who were born in the Soviet Union but not in the Russian Federation or Ukraine who have moved. Ah, I so, see. so that's part of what's going on. But the second part of it ha has to do with the emergence of labor uh, immigration networks, for example, from Central Asia into Siberia or to Moscow. And this, these issues, um, what you're, you're right about is there aren't any lines lining up around Russian embassies because the Russian state immigration policies are so underdeveloped that yep. it's uh, – uh, a lot of this is informal and what we would probably call illegal immigration. But what it does do is it points to, um, and, and this is where I'm going with this, the economic expansion in the Russian case driven by oil is creating a demand for labor that is being fed by 
uh, a, a mass movement of people informally largely out of control. And that also has implications, I think. Where are they coming from? They're, they're mainly coming uh, in the Russian case from uh, Central Asia. Uh, in the Ukrainian case, they're coming from Afghanistan, uh, from mm. Iraq, uh, from mm -hmm. Africa. Uh, and it's, uh, it's a v but what that suggests is that this is a part of the world that is being transformed in ways in which we haven't really considered before. And it suggests that some of the issues that you've, you've raised about health and about the need for infrastructure and the need, infrastructure being government capacity to manage mm -hmm. uh, these issues are, are really uh, very much on the table. And, and, and it's important when you get into healthcare issues to understand this dy dynamic as well. I can't speak for the full committee, but uh, I think as Russia begins to gorge on petrodollars, the appetite for sending American aid to Russia will, uh, will diminish. Mm -hmm. Jennifer? Well, I, I had a question and maybe a comment. Um, thanks for that fairly bleak outlook. Um, <laughs> and let me just say I'm not a Russia expert, but um, one of, I wondered about your expectations for this, the upcoming G8. Um, uh, one of the uh, HIV AIDS has been such a, a, a hot topic in previous G8 summits. I think this time... Uh, and it kind of goes to your point of Russia looking outwards and to some certain extent neglecting uh, its internal problems. Mm -hmm. uh, Russia was insistent that it talk about this in a broader global health context. And I think some people think that was to avoid being too introspective on the problems yes. that they're facing. Um, I, I, I want, what do you think is going to come out? Uh, what are you, what's your best expectation, your worst scenario? I, I'm not an expert, so that means I can say something with absolute authority. Well, you're talking to a non-expert, too. So. Um, <laughs> that makes it even better. I can say whatever I want, and you can't contradict you. me. Um, my sense of things is that uh, the unease over Putin's apparent move towards authoritarianism will be the dominant factor of what happens at the G8. There are those in the government, I do not think, uh, they are controlling at the moment. But I have heard those in the, in the uh, government say we shouldn't even go to St. Petersburg. We should not legitimatize what Putin is doing by showing up. Now, that's the Jimmy Carter to the Olympics approach, and I don't think it bought us anything with respect to the Olympics, uh, Jimmy Carter's refusal to go to the Olympics. And I, my own sense is that it would be a mistake if President Bush were to say, I won't go to St. Petersburg, I won't participate in the G8 meeting. But um, there's a lot of concern about Putin and, and what he's doing. And of course, the proof of the pudding will be whether or not he steps down at the end of his term. Uh, if he somehow finds a way to amend the Constitution to allow him to uh, have another election and the election is rigged, why, we're back to the days of the czars. Not the commissars, but the czars. And uh, Putin acts like a czar in many regards, if you see how he lives. And um, I, HIV AIDS is something everybody can talk about and be on the side of the angels about. So I would expect the communiques that would come out of it would all be very positive and very strong. But I think uh, you have to recognize that the conference itself will take place against the background of this, this cloud of, uh, uh, that I described, the Europeans worrying about what Putin's going to do at the other end of the pipeline and the Americans worrying about Putin slipping back into an authoritarian regime. Kent Hughes. Thank you for your remarks, Senator. I'm Kent Hughes at the Wilson Center here. You mentioned that uh, the war over the war is over and the focus in Europe very much on energy dependence and probably a desire to move in the other direction. Yeah, I, I don't think that that's entirely true. Uh, you read the French newspapers, the war is still going on. But uh, at least among these policymakers, that was the case. And, of course, the president put the same message before us in the State of the Union, accusing us uh, accurately, I would say, of being addicted to petroleum. 
Is there a role for the, with both sides of the Atlantic focused on this question of energy dependence? Is there a role for that transatlantic policy network to play in clarifying the choices we might have? Uh, the network provides lines of communications. It doesn't necessarily set policy. But what I see happening in terms of the people who come to my office to talk to me and, and things I hear from the Europeans and so on, uh, classic market economics. Uh, whenever the price of something goes up and stays up, Human ingenuity invents alternatives. Uh, this is why the doomsdayers and the environmental movement have always been wrong. They keep saying, well, we're running out of fill in the blank. Well, market economics say when you start to run out of blank, its price goes up. And when its price goes up, people can afford to create a substitute for blank that would have been too expensive before, but now makes some sense. And when the substitute is created, then all of a sudden there is a huge supply of what it is you used blank for. <coughs> it, the, the old line in the business world, nobody wants a quarter inch drill. What they want is quarter inch holes. Nobody wants oil. What they want is the energy that oil provides for them. And if energy is now expensive enough at $70 a barrel, people will start to produce alternatives. And over the long run, you will end up with more energy than you have now, and it will be cheaper. And already, with oil at $70 a barrel, People are making investments in Utah, Colorado, and Wyoming in oil shale. There's more oil in Utah, Wyoming, and Colorado than there is in Saudi Arabia. But it's too expensive to get out of rock. It costs about $30 a barrel to get it out. Compared to a lifting cost of a dollar and a half, nobody's going to invest in oil shale. But if the price stays at $60 a barrel, for any appreciable period of time, and you can get it at $30 a barrel, you can double by selling it at a $60 price. And what will happen as soon as all of that oil comes onto the world market is that with that huge supply, the price of all oil will come down, including that out of Saudi Arabia. Tidal energy. I've got people in my office talking about capturing the tides to generate electricity. Tidal energy is an idea that's been around since the 1920s. Why haven't we built it? Because natural gas was cheaper. Well, natural gas isn't cheaper anymore. <laughs> and tidal facilities with new technology can be built. Met with a guy yesterday talking about gasification of coal. We've got more coal in the United States we, we, we got enough coal to, if it could be gasified and turned into oil, would last us for 300 years at our present rates of consumption. But to gasify it, you've got to get $35 a barrel for the gas, for the oil that you produce. And if the oil price stays at 60 for long enough to people, for people to build those facilities and they can produce it at 35 and then the volume takes over, then the price comes down. Ultimately, market forces will solve this problem, and America has the natural resources to do it. And the Saudis know that because the last time oil hit $80 a barrel in the 70s and people started exploring oil shale in Utah, they said, uh-oh, we're going to lose this market completely, and they drove the price of oil down to $15 and destroyed all of the oil shale investments. This time, I don't think they're going to be able to drive it down. I want to get a sense of the room. I know there are two questions in the front. Let me just see if anybody knows they have questions other than the front. Okay. Why don't we go with the gentleman in the middle first, and then we'll go to Cindy. Uh, 
Dr. Rubel, with regard to immigration to Russia from Central Asia, do we have the statistics so that it can be broken down between ethnic Russians who are leaving, be, uh, you know, analogous to the French colognes leaving Algeria because they're, they're no longer the heron folk, and, and to what extent it's indigenous Central Asians who are going to Russia uh, for, for work? I, I will very briefly answer that question, but I, I, I think more attention should be given to Senator. No, I want to know the answer, um, too. The answer, no, the answer is that there are demographers who are studying this. It is an informal migration, so there's a lot that is unknown. And actually, the person with the microphone now is one of the people who knows more about this than anybody. It is, it is largely an emerging uh, labor migration of indigenous Central Asians who are going either to Kazakhstan or to Siberia to find work, largely seasonal. And there is an increasing dependence upon remittances back home from this population. And it is emerging as an analogous kind of migration. Not, it's not a perfect analog, uh, an, an, analogy, but it is similar to what we see between Central America and North America. These are people who are going back and forth to earn money. It is often seasonal. And it is, but we're well beyond the Russians returning home at this point. It has to do with economic opportunity. There are also similar migration patterns emerging from the Caucasus to Moscow and from actually from Ukraine and Moldova to Moscow as well. Yeah. Cindy? Uh, Professor Cindy Buckley from the University of Texas. Um, Senator, again, thank you for joining us this afternoon. And I wondered if, um, since I've got the last question, if we could take you back to um, the third point um, covered by the Freedom Support Act, that of security. And mm -hmm. I would appreciate it if you could discuss, however briefly, how policymakers are viewing or not viewing emergent inf infectious diseases such as HIV AIDS as a security threat. Probably not as much as they should. Um, the demographic studies that I have looked at, which come mainly from UN figures, do not have calculated into them in their population projections the impact of a pandemic. And uh, I showed my figures proudly to uh, Secretary Levitt. And he said, Bob, that's probably right unless you know I mean he's up he's up to his eyeballs right now worrying about uh, bird flu and what bird flu could do and he said looking at the countries because I, I made a list I should have brought it with me I made a list of the 12 largest countries in 1950 and all eight of the combatants in World War II were on the list World War II was a, was a fight between the world's most populous countries. And then 2000, and Italy had dropped off, and Japan had dropped off, and France had dropped off. And then we projected out to 2050, 100 years later. And the only two combatants of World War II that were still in the 12 largest countries were the United States and China. And all the other combatants had gone, and they'd been replaced by Bangladesh and Pakistan and Brazil and, and so on. And Secretary Levitt said, how many of these countries are susceptible to a pandemic? And you will see their population decimated. So that's something that I have not seen quantified in these studies. But I think the Secretary's uh, uh, caution, and, and you're raising the question, makes it clear that there are probably some surprises in the uh, demographic projections. I said demographics are the trend that are the most difficult to change. But the demographers also say to me, it depends on how far you go out. If you're talking five years, the numbers are dead on because those people have all been born. 
and the birth rate and birth patterns of, of those women are, are, are set. If you're talking 10 years, you're still probably okay. If you get beyond 20 years, it's just, this is a guess. So um, it will be very interesting to see how it plays out. But back to, to my basic point, the leaders of the governments involved appear to me, and I put that caveat on, I could be completely wrong, but they appear to me to be more focused on their short-term political power than they are on the long-term consequences of some of the things they're doing. Uh, case in point, very obvious, China. The leaders of China are focused on one thing and one thing only, and that is short-term economic growth. <coughs> and whatever you do, whatever you propose to them, they will measure against that yardstick. And if they're not going to get aggressive short-term economic growth out of what they're doing, they won't do it. And as a consequence, China has had extraordinary economic growth and it's gone on for a dozen years. They're growing, they're not growing at the rate of GDP growth they report because their, their uh, statistical system of keeping track of things is obviously absurd. How do, you, how do you give a GDP number on the last day of the year? <laughs> this is what we did last year. <laughs> no, 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 guys. You <laughs> Even in America, where we have the most sophisticated, you don't announce GDP numbers till well into the next quarter, and then you always revise them after you get more data. And then, and then maybe you revise them again. You know, we announced 4.8% GDP growth in the last quarter of 2005, uh, about 45 days ago, 60 days ago. And then we revised it up to 5.3 within the last 30 days. And it could it very easily be revised again. China, they'll tell you on the 31st of December what they did that year. So you know the number isn't right. But nonetheless, even allowing for that, the Chinese have been growing at double digits for over, over a decade. And that absolutely cannot continue. If they don't start making some serious long-term investments, the returns of which will not be seen in next quarter's numbers, they're buying themselves serious long-term problems. And of course their demographic pattern is really scary because they are looking at the one, two, four pyramid with one worker supporting two parents who are supporting four grandparents. And there's no way that's going to work. And the other thing I found when I was in China, they said the, the children that are coming out of China's one-child policy are spoiled. There's only one child, and while a child is there, it's the reverse pyramid. It's the two parents doting over the one child. And uh, they have more money to spend on the one child than uh, would previously be the case, and the, the child, when, when he or she, and it's as much the she's as it is the he's, moves to Beijing and gets an apartment and has a job, he's not interested in a family. This is, this is a good life. <laughs> I don't, I don't want to get married and, and have a child and, and, and have to, no, I've been pampered all my life. I'm going to continue to be quite self-centered. And then the other side of it, I was told, no matter how small the village, how primitive the village in China, if you have electricity there, you have a sonogram. Because the women do not want to have girls. The girl won't be able to support them in their old age. And since they're, they're required by law to have only one, it better be a boy. So the level of abortion in China is very high, and it's, it's primarily female. And in that cohort, 
where the one-child policy has produced the children, the ratio of male to female is 120 men to every 100 women. And that's creating all kinds of interesting social challenges. Already trafficking in women is starting. They're being kidnapped for, for brothels and uh, the sex trade because there, there aren't enough available. So you look 30 years, 40 years down the road with that kind of demographic in China. And you got enormous problems and then the failure to invest in their long-term infrastructure begins to hit on the economic side. And uh, uh, Lou Dobbs to the contrary notwithstanding, I am not afraid of China. But um, they, of course they have uh, among the peasants in China, they have absolutely no health care sophistication of any kind. And uh, one of the reasons that people are moving to Moscow is the same thing. You don't get it in rural, uh, rural Russia. You don't get any kind of significant health care benefits. So the discipline you're studying is filled with all kinds of uh, challenges and surprises and uh, unusual twists. And politicians like me that pontificate about how firm everything's going to be in the future are always wrong. <laughs> Senator, thank you very much. I thank you for coming down and joining us. It's my pleasure. I'm, a, I'm honored to be invited among, to speak to a group of people who know what they're talking about. And, uh, <laughs> well, that's not often the case in the Senate. Uh, <laughs> now, we'll, now we'll give them a chance to prove that they know what they're talking about. <laughs>
Um, I hope you're not all freezing. I was in, in Russia actually at record setting cold a few months ago and um, it's beginning to remind me of that in here. Um, I'm going to mostly be exhortative, so I'm not going to talk, uh, and, and in a way this is a bad model of a PowerPoint presentation. It's got way too many words, not enough graphs. But uh, what I want to do is to speak just a little bit repeating a message I suspect you've heard a lot over the last two or three days about what we don't know, but a bit more about the issue of putting together knowledge we do know um, and uh, of the way in which social science may uh, play an important role in confronting the HIV AIDS pandemic. This isn't just an exhortation for research in either a policy or an academic mode. In fact, it's an exhortation for trying to get rid of the distinction between basic and applied research a little bit and integrating these two sides of the picture more, recognizing that knowledge that is developed in pursuit of solutions to practical problems can be fundamentally transformative for our scientific understanding and the other way around, that we really need to mobilize the knowledge we have in core disciplinary arenas, the social science, in order to better deal with the issues raised by the pandemic so that I think we hurt ourselves if we make too sharp a distinction between policy research and academic research as though these are completely separate undertakings that don't really connect up with each other, or at least not after we leave graduate school. And um, I'll connect back a little bit to some of the comments of Senator Bennett, if only to suggest, I think in the spirit of Cindy Buckley's question, that we need to see AIDS as an issue for freedom and democracy, for economic development, for security, for these very themes that we tend to put on the table um, in um, our political and economic discussions and not connect up nearly enough to the underlying health issues here. So there's increasingly wide recognition of the staggering proportions of the AIDS pandemic. This isn't news, right? These always repeated statistics aren't a surprise, not only not in this room, but they're in the New York Times. They're in the sort of general circulation now. So we're past the point where nobody recognizes this. We're more at the point where nobody thinks it's news and it no longer motivates to say the shocking AIDS crisis. It doesn't shock and it doesn't mobilize funds. Um, and it doesn't transform the research agenda. Now, an interesting thing through all of that is that this hasn't moved to the front and center of any academic social science discipline's concern. So even though we now all know 40 million people in the world are living with AIDS, there is no academic social science discipline that acts as though it's aware of that. The field that probably has the most research on AIDS is anthropology, and most anthropologists to do sustained research on AIDS work in schools of public health, not departments of anthropology, um, and move um, outside of the core disciplinary system. So there are concerns there, and this continues to shape the work that goes on in the so-called um, second wave of uh, the pandemic globally and the extent to which we do or do not learn from the first wave as we look at second wave countries, but also the question of the extent to which we do and do not learn from what we already knew of those second wave countries. That is, it's not just a matter of finding out what worked in Uganda. Oh, well, here was a program for changing knowledge, attitudes, and behavior. Now we will replicate it precisely in Russia or the Ukraine. It's a matter of mobilizing the knowledge we have of Russia and the Ukraine to be able to understand the way in which things work there and coupling that with what we know about the pandemic in a broader range um, of countries. There are a variety of different sorts of issues, and I'm not going to go through all of this. For one thing, I actually can realize now that I just copied the long rather than the short version of <laughs> my slideshow, so I'm going to really zip through these. Um, but the point that I want to make here, and just evoke, is that the pandemic is less and less a single unified phenomenon, and it never really was a single unified phenomenon. It was a cluster of multiple epidemics and pandemics, even in biological terms, but certainly in social um, and political and economic terms, and the spread in a wide range of places in the world only further differentiates in many ways. 
There are a range of familiar numbers. These are out of date. They're only up to 2004. All those problems with reporting the GDP um, on, on uh, December 31st apply as well to aid statistics um, in um, the region. But the growth rate is rapid. Now, one of the things to pause on, though, when we notice that the growth rate is extremely rapid, we put up statistics like there's been a 50 percent increase, is it's from a low base but also that there is a catch to repeating these statistics and repeating them in particular as a way of trying to motivate policymakers. It's a common feature of the global AIDS discussion that there is somebody um, trying to get the ear of every president or prime minister to say, look at these shocking numbers, they're going up. Um, and that isn't a particularly effective message all the time, but also it's a misleading message because these numbers are highly variable throughout the country in every country, even in places like Botswana with some of the world's highest um, prevalence rates. They're geographically dispersed. They vary um, by age cohorts. They vary between urban and rural populations, right? There are a whole series of these variables. And so the way in which the impact of the AIDS pandemic works out is through these other social um, variables that explain some of that differentiation. There's, um, in that sense, something misleading of continuing to think of the epidemic as an epidemic of millions of individuals and not focusing more on the extent to which it is a social condition with social effects um, and an economic condition with economic effects and a political condition with political effects. And in each of these arenas, the, um, this is not a matter simply of adding up the number of sick individuals and asking what the political effects or the economic effects or the social effects are. It is a matter of looking at the way in which the social organization of the pandemic and the global response to the pandemic have a variety of social and economic effects. Now, there are a couple of quotes from Paul Farmer's comments on this and their limits of thinking in terms of individual risks. Two quick, I won't read them out, um, but two quick points being made by this. One is that there is a um, fairly widespread recognition of the limits of trying to think in terms of individual risk and individual behavior change as a paradigm for tackling um, the pandemic. And there is at the same time a continual reproduction of the orientation because we actually have the skills to do this well. We actually know how to do the work. We know how to publish the articles. The reviewers know how to judge whether they're competent. You can get your work into the major journals. So there's a certain reproduction logic to this. And it's harder to move outside of the work on individual risk factors and um, responses targeted at them um, some of the time than it needs to be. So that even though we know that there are limits to thinking this way, we actually haven't developed some of the paradigms that enable us to think more effectively in other ways. And so simply harping on those limits doesn't get there. People like Paul Farmer, just to stick for a moment to that example, have stressed such things as AIDS being a disease of poverty. And uh, not just of poverty, but of inequality, right? That is, it's not just being poor, but living in highly unequal societies. It's vulnerable. Inequality is indeed basic. They're right. But inequality alone isn't the whole story either. And anyone who tells you that there is any single variable whole story is misleading you. There's not a single variable whole story. There are a whole series of different things coinciding. And part of what makes this such a basic fundamental issue for social science is precisely the coincidence of several different factors, of political and economic factors, of demographic factors, of the healthcare system conditions, and so forth. We often don't pause to see this, I think, and we're very susceptible to these one variable explanations, partly because of the way in which we frame the AIDS pandemic as an emergency. This is something that is sudden and unpredictable and therefore demands an immediate humanitarian response. Well, it's been around 25 years. It's not sudden and unpredictable. It's been growing for quite a while. Um, with a slight modification of the previous discussion about demographic projections, we know a fair amount about it, and we are able to predict with some accuracy, albeit declining into the future and with numbers of variables. So um, to think simply as an emergency is misleading. Now, that doesn't mean there aren't urgent health care needs and there aren't people suffering who need um, antiretrovirals and so forth, but it means that we mislead ourselves if we think that we shouldn't take time to do some serious research 
on the social character of the pandemic and on what makes various kinds of responses effective or not. If we interpret it being an emergency as meaning it's an exception to all of the rest of social life and something to which we only respond with the ethical imperative of immediate action, we deprive ourselves of the opportunity to do the research that will enable us to make our responses next year better than this year, better still five years and 10 years from now, and we are still going to be struggling to respond to the AIDS pandemic when all of us in this room have passed away, right? So contrary to that issue about what we're gonna see while we're still alive in transformation, the AIDS pandemic may become endemic, but in any case, it's not going away right away. Right? It is something that we are going to be struggling with for years to come. And so we had better learn more about how it works and how different kinds of interventions work in this way. It's entangled with a variety of other issues, like the issue of um, intellectual property rights and investment in and control of antiretroviral drugs and other treatments and so forth, and the way they're linked to profit and all of this. It's entangled in a range of different emergencies, if you want to call them emergencies. Um, that is, it's entangled with armed conflict in a variety of places and the displacement of refugee populations, which affects it. So part of the story of the migration, I think Blair was on the verge of saying this and commenting on the um, Central Asian and other migrations into Russia, but throughout the world and throughout the Eurasian region is labor migrants are very prime vectors for the spread of AIDS. And people who are displaced from wars in Central Asia, armed conflicts, are prime vectors for the spread of AIDS. And peacekeeping troops and other troops as they move around are prime vectors for the spread of AIDS. And so if you think the vectors are only microbes and you miss these social vectors to it, you miss something very important about what's going on with this. This is also something that increases the gender structure of the pandemic. Um, it increases the vulnerability of women in a variety of ways. It increases demand for commercial sex work. Um, and it increases the likelihood of coerced sex. Right? So all of this changes the gender dynamic of the disease. The AIDS pandemic is also being played out against the background of a variety of other social transformations. Now, this is in one sense complicating for trying to have those single factor explanations and a neat tidy um, summing up of the disease, but it also is what makes it really interesting and important and an opportunity for doing social science that can change how we think about other issues in our various disciplines and interdisciplinary fields. It's also something, though, that matters a great deal for planning effective interventions, and these two go hand in hand. If we don't pay attention to the way these other social transformations complicate the provision of treatment and care, we aren't going to do this very well. Um, an easy to grasp, though hard to fix, set of problems are the various fiscal crises that have weakened healthcare systems. And there are lots of versions of this. Structural adjustment played a big role in Africa. That's not the core issue in Russia, but there's a fiscal crisis in the Russian healthcare system too, for different reasons. Right? Some of the kinds of attempts to deal with these fiscal crises in many ways make matters worse um, or at least complicate them. And there are a variety of questions here about whether serious, honest numbers are being produced by social scientists that can do things like get the Minister of Finance and the Minister of Health in any particular country on the same page in trying to consider such things as how much money should be allocated for ARV treatment and how it should be distributed because it's very hard to get models that are meaningful in all of this. Issues of education um, are basic and, and is international um, systems are worth mentioning. That is, part of the global response to AIDS depends on a variety of international agreements, non-governmental and governmental organizations, treaties, the United Nations, and other organizations, which are under huge stress. You may have noticed there's a little stress in the United Nations recently, um, and um, that stress comes from a variety of different quarters, but it makes it harder for the United Nations to be at the center of the global response to the HIV AIDS pandemic when it is also dealing with these other ranges of stresses and reorganization and when it's being asked to pick up the pieces after a variety of international interventions of various kinds. Um, and there are more national and local versions of this, like unemployment rates and various ways in which this interacts with other kinds of issues. And these are interactions, moreover, I'm sorry I'm rushing through this so much, these are interactions that are actually also biological and social interactions, right? When you talk about unemployment, 
famine, starvation, malnutrition, right? You talk about social and biological conditions at once, and you talk about conditions that actually affect the capacity to use various kinds of treatment regimes in confronting HIV AIDS. Malnourished people show AIDS symptoms faster, and they absorb ARVs less well. Right? So that you've got various interactions that are going on about this that are crucial. Now, none of this means that we can't respond. None of this means, oh, well, we have to somehow first fix the problems of global inequality and the organization of the international system and the United Nations, and only then can we deal with the pandemic. We have to deal with the pandemic in real time now, but we have to understand how it's intertwined with these various other issues, and that's the responsibility of the people in this room. Right? It's your responsibility to figure out how these things connect up. Right? It's not only a matter of some new facts, some new pieces of knowledge. It's a matter of connecting those effectively into some larger pictures, whether they're organized in geographic regional terms, or they're organized at national levels, or they're organized in terms of disciplinary theories. In any of those cases, connecting the factual information is as important as discovering some new facts here. And these new facts, nonetheless, and new thinking about this can translate into effective action. I just pulled up a Brazilian example of this because Brazil's done better than most places in trying to deal with the pandemic that just suggests, you know, basically that um, the approximately 87% of those who require treatment with ARVs in Brazil are receiving them. That's a very high percentage um, for a middle-level country in the income tables. Right? The AIDS-related death rate has been cut in half. The um, government in Brazil is using some of its economic clout to bargain effectively with international pharmaceutical companies, and so forth and so on. There are a variety of these issues where we can turn our knowledge into effective practice. Well, in sum, on this part of things, the AIDS crisis requires both a sense of urgency and a sense of patience, the point I tried to make before. It demands our urgent attention because millions of people suffer and die because it affects economic development and political stability, right? But it also demands that we think about it as something that can't be solved overnight, that we have to factor into our longer term understanding of how we're going to work and build healthcare systems and deal with economic development. Even if an effective vaccine were available tomorrow, which it won't be, although there's some progress, somewhat debated, and maybe others will be able to speak better to it on the question of vaccines, it would be at least a generation and more likely two or three before it could be generally available throughout the world. Right? And it might never be generally available throughout the world because it might be available in every country in urban centers and very hard to distribute in rural areas. And if that was the case, it might lead to drug-resistant strains of the disease developing because of the unequal distribution of the vaccine. And these are a matter of social science questions, of basic social questions about the ability to distribute the vaccine, not only the fundamental research in trying to develop the vaccine. So there are big issues to think about in that. It, the disease integrates natural and social or cultural elements. It's important to take a biosocial approach to it. It's important to know something about the disease in order to do serious social science research on it and vice versa. That said, it is still true that there is a lot less social science than needed. Um, you'll be glad to know that I, I did not include in this a whole series of slightly depressing si slides about the publications in social science and the relative small number and compartmentalization of, of uh, venue of the publications that take place. There's surprisingly little social science there. It tends to be concentrated in a few subfields in the various disciplines, and it often tends to move out to professional schools. It would be really great if one of the effects of the pandemic were to promote stronger relationships between the field of public health and social science. 30 years ago, the relationships between the academic disciplines of social science and public health schools were stronger, for the most part, than they are now. In various ways, they've pulled apart. Without trying to go into that in any detail, it would be a helpful thing if they were reintegrated to a greater extent in all of this. 
So we need to work on some questions of knowledge. Part, eval, effectively mobilizing and improving social knowledge is as important to combating the disease as drugs or condoms, I would suggest. And it really is an issue in part of mobilizing knowledge because a lot of the knowledge is knowledge we already have. A lot of what we need to know about is dynamics of gender interaction or of community resilience and stability. Right? It's not things that social scientists have never studied, but it's things that social scientists have inadequately connected to the AIDS pandemic in which they've looked inadequately at the way this plays out in different specific regions of the world. Okay? Part of what should come from this improved social science is a reframing of the way we think about some of the issues. Take the statement that AIDS is spread by sexual contact. This is, of course, true. But AIDS is also spread by injected drugs, contaminated blood supply, by mothers giving birth. But even then, right, it's also spread by labor migrations, by civil wars, as I said before, by peacekeeping forces, by rape, by hospitals without sterilization equipment, including such high technology goods as soap, right, and by ignorance. Right? So if we want to understand how the disease is spread, we have to link our biomedical knowledge to knowledge of these and other social factors. Prevention programs need to take all this into account. Or again, take the statement that antiretroviral drugs are expensive. This is surely true, whether or not the ARVs in questions are generic, because even the generics are relatively expensive for most countries. It's true whether or not drug companies need additional income to support new research or their price gouging. But it obscures another question. Compared to what? Right? If ARVs ward off opportunistic infections that would result in expensive hospital visits, how much does that save? If they help main employers maintain skilled labor forces, how much does that save? It's no accident that employers operate insur um, insurance schemes that provide health care services for workers in lots of industries around the world, that China and South Africa have two-tier health care systems in which skilled workers do get coverage because their employers have figured out it would cost too much to lose them. Right? If the ARVs keep school teachers alive so that more don't have to be trained, how much does that save? If they provide potential orphans with real living parents, how much does that save? These are not just rhetorical questions I want to claim. I think they are really serious questions. How much is saved? Well, we don't know. It's easy for me to state these as rhetorical questions. It would be almost impossible for me to quantify these or to model them effectively right, right now. But it's not impossible in principle. It could be done with some serious work, and it could be done pretty fast. We could come up with sensible models that would enable a much more effective discussion of this, that would improve our social science understanding, it would improve policymaking in a variety of different national governments and other settings to look at and be effectively able to say just how much would we save in these various arenas, how many hospital visits would be cut back and so forth. Our macroeconomic models of the AIDS pandemic are very clumsy, clunky models. They've gotten a lot better in terms of the strictly economic variables, those things for which the prices are relatively easily ascertained. But as is true of many macroeconomic models, they do a much less good job of integrating other kinds of variables um, into the picture besides those that have easy um, price indicators. In addition, I would suggest, AIDS is too often studied only as a dependent variable. We always want to know what can stem the tide of AIDS infections. We always want to know what can stop transmission. We should look more often at the impact of the pandemic and the ways in which it helps to produce a variety of other social changes. Now, it can be transformative, and I would suggest that there are potential transformations, but I would suggest also that we be a little bit cautious about leaping to the wild accounts of these sorts of transformations. We've often gotten off a bit on the wrong foot in this, in thinking about the global pandemic in small ways, right, something that starts by looking at a disease of, um, thinking of this as a disease of homosexual men that turns out to be a disease largely of heterosexual women, global terms, and so forth, a variety of other 
ways in which we get off on the wrong foot, not thinking enough about labor migration and so forth, not thinking enough about the variety of this. The point of this map of Africa is only to show you that there are several different colors and that they represent different levels of seropositive HIV prevalence in the population. In other words, Africa is not just a picture of uniform high prevalence of AIDS. It's highly diverse, and this is going to happen everywhere. There are very few studies of low prevalence areas, even in Africa. All the studies target high prevalence areas, or almost all of them, right? We really need to know um, more about that. Differ differentiating, not just generalizing, is crucial to our knowledge. So I said all of this. I don't, and I'm going to skip over the fact that we have some of this knowledge. I'm talking too long, right? We need the empirical evidence in order to improve practical programs. But we also need empirical evidence about those practical programs. A big part of what we need to know more about in the world of HIV AIDS is the effects of the attempts to deal with the pandemic, right? What else are healthcare workers not doing in Botswana when HIV AIDS is declared to be the number one agenda and the almost overwhelmingly number one agenda because of the international money that flows into the country? Well, where is that going to translate into in policies elsewhere? What is going to be going on in all of that? And how do on the ground healthcare workers understand this? Do we know very much? Do we really know anything about how nurses in hospitals understand AIDS um, in Central Asia? How much? How many ethnographies have been done that would reveal of that? A lot of the research needs to connect up to evaluation, not in the sense of was the money spent honestly and did they do what they said they were going to do when they applied for the grant, but the sense of really learning what factors make interventions work and not work and how to connect those up to different conditions in different local settings. There is an enormous um, near industry of scholarly literature trying to learn from Uganda. Um, but there is um, surprisingly little literature on Botswana, just to take two different examples of Africa. Now, Botswana had what was one of the largest public health interventions in the history of the world. And it is amazing that there is not very much study on this um, and that it is not very well, high, not terribly high quality, not very well represented in the literature when we want to then turn and propose new public health agendas in other parts of the world and all of this. We need to pay attention to a whole series of macro-social factors. I'm just going to end by saying that, right? We need to move to knowledge that um, is oriented to different time frames from the immediate to the middle-term future to the long-term future. When we think about the long-term impact of the pandemic, Right? We need to recognize that one of the possibilities is that in several settings it could become endemic and that there could be varying wave patterns and that these wave patterns could have repeats if there are drug resistant strains of the diseases and because there are multiple infections and so forth. There are a whole series of these actions of these issues and they could result in various structural changes at a basic level of transformation. But AIDS is not the Black Death. And to go around saying there is going to be massive depopulation um, automatically is to mislead policymakers and to produce a sort of scare tactic that so quickly looks wrong that it actually undermines the necessary message that AIDS could bring serious population transformations, even though it's unlikely to bring that particular kind of population of depopulation and mass transformation. What there's much more likely to be and already is visible in many parts of the world are, de are sort of restructuring and destructuring of populations at local community levels, at regional and provincial levels, in certain occupations, and a whole variety of other arenas. Um, gender is a particularly good place to see this, right? It's shifting relationships. It's not a disappearance of human beings entirely. Um, and all of this. Gender is really, really central to this. You will not understand the disease without looking in serious ways at um, gender and age-related gender balance questions of various kinds. There are a variety of distributional questions about where treatment goes and who bears the costs of treatment in various ways, as well as a whole set of questions about what we might think of as the care economy. Right? How is care organized? What does it mean, for example, if um, leading parts of development theory say the most important thing is to get women into school, 
but the assumption of almost every HIV AIDS treatment program is that women will be a whole, at home caring for sick members of their families. Right? We've got tensions between what different actors in the same development agencies are stating as policy at the same time in all of this. Add the issue of orphans and children to that, I won't try to go to it, um, in all of this, a variety of development issues, a variety of governance issues and economic issues in all of this. Um, all of these have distributive questions. One of the things that AIDS does is redistribute wealth in the world. It doesn't just burn it up, it redistributes who has it, as is true of many social phenomena. At the SSRC, I've been asked to tell you as an advertisement, we're working on pieces of this. I won't go into it at any length. We are very concerned with the issues of gender, the issues of conflict, and in fact, the way gender and conflict interact with each other in several regions of the world um, to exacerbate the pandemic, the way issues of gender-based violence at a variety of levels from inside families um, to larger scales are at issue. The social structure of communities, a level that has been surprisingly little studied. There is more at the level of families and there's more at the level of whole nation states. There is a real dearth of knowledge at the level of communities. It's important to work on this. It's important to work on care and how it's given. And it's important to work, we think, on the public health systems as such, where they're getting their personnel, how they're organized, and how um, they are or are not being informed by social science knowledge. Thank you. Okay, now we'll hear from Jennifer. Thanks. Gosh, I know what, you're sitting directly under a fan there. That's why I was <laughs> so I was wondering, okay. what are you talking about until I sat there? Um, <laughs> Uh, thanks. I'm very glad to be here. I'm going to talk a little bit about CSIS and our task force on HIV AIDS. CSIS is the Center for Strategic and International Studies, a think tank here in Washington. Uh, it was founded about 40 years ago uh, to focus on uh, principally strategic threats and priorities on the international scene. Um, and it's, it's interesting now that we have this big HIV AIDS program because uh, while we began as I think something of a Cold War institution, it shows how the definition of strategic and of security has really evolved over time. Um, we primarily see ourselves as our, our, our principal target audience is the Congress and the, uh, and the administration and the broader U.S. policymaking uh, community. I think we see ourselves uh, something as an expanded policy planning office. Uh, oftentimes, policymakers are caught up in the crisis of the day, not able really to um, look down the horizon to see what's coming, what are the next, next threats that they're going to have to contend with, nor to distill a lot of the language or a lot of the information um, that Dr. Calhoun was talking about um, that's coming out of research or academic um, not even able to digest that and transform it into um, policy initiatives. Um, I think we see ourselves as having something of a convening function, bringing um, stakeholders from the corporate world, the activist world, um, congressional members, administration, uh, and so forth, into uh, kind of developing consensus-based uh, policy recommendations. Um, uh, I, I should say, well, and, and to a certain extent, bridging uh, academia, as I said, uh, kind of distilling that kind of information into recommendations that policymakers can use. I think it's important. CSIS, uh, although it had the reputation of being somewhat right of center, is very carefully nonpartisan or very bipartisan, and we make every effort to kind of reach out to both sides of the aisle, and particularly to kind of give constructive balanced um, advice, useful advice, and not gratuitous uh, kind of bashing uh, to whichever administration happens to be in power. Uh, let me talk a little bit about the task force on HIV AIDS, which began, it, began in the Africa program in 2001. It's, it's funded 
principally by the uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And it was uh, designed originally to be a senior level forum that would bring together these various public health experts, non-governmental organizations, activists, implementers, bring them together with uh, congressional leaders and administration official officials to build consensus and help develop very forward-looking analysis and recommendations. Again, it was carefully not, or carefully bipartisan, I should say. Um, as our initial co-chairs, we had Senator Bill Frist and Senator John Kerry, two prominent and powerful uh, uh, Senate leaders, a Democrat and a Republican. Kerry eventually uh, had to become an honorary chair because he had bigger things on his mind. Uh, and Senator Feingold and Senator Frist are now our two co-chairs. Um, we had strong congressional participation in this from both the House and the Senate. And over time, we've developed a fairly st strong, constructive relationship with the Office of the Global AIDS Coordinator. Um, as I said, it originated in the Africa program, and initially we focused on some of the big thematic issues. This was before the PEPFAR, the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief, and the Office of the Global AIDS Coordinating Office were established. And the big push early on was just to get policymakers to take this more seriously. There was building momentum in the late 90s under the Clinton administration. Um, but people even then were talking about, uh, you know, one billion was like the, uh, the gold, you know, could we really ask the Congress for one billion on this? And um, so the big push early on was on resource mobilization. Um, we worked closely with the Global Fund as it was kind of setting up its structures. Uh, we helped inform the broad policy that eventually led to the first carry legislation, which in turn led to the creation of PEPFAR. Uh, in that first phase, we had working groups on U.S. public attitudes on um, assistance to global HIV AIDS. And I think we were able to demonstrate that there was an openness there. People, uh, the average American, uh, thinks we spend much more than we do, actually, on foreign assistance. And so uh, it, it gave, you know, we were able to say, you know, there's an openness and there's a willingness there um, that, that Congress people can push on. You're not going to lose political points for pushing uh, for higher, higher uh, levels of U.S. funding on HIV AIDS. Uh, we had a, a very strong working group that continues its day on the special vulnerabilities of women and girls. Um, there was a lot of lit service at that time of how central uh, um, women and girls were to the epidemic, um, being more biologically uh, vulnerable but also less able to negotiate the terms of sex. Uh, but there wasn't much of a strategy of how to incorporate that, incorporate that into programs. And even when the PEPFAR uh, session was set up, where the PEPFAR uh, office was set up, um, the feeling was, well, women and girls, we can't, do, we can't do everything. We're doing AIDS here. And um, I think in part, you know, we, we don't take all the credit, but I think what we were pushing for was how you can wrap some of those things into your HIV AIDS program, and you can wrap e HIV AIDS into legal counseling services or uh, uh, rural assistance programs and so forth. So th there are ways to integrate the two. Um, we, we had... Um, a, bi a big uh, a committee on the security implications of HIV AIDS, looking at the vulnerability of, of militaries, of peacekeepers, of uniform personnel, and the, the possible security impacts there, but also looking at the effects that HIV AIDS has on critical infrastructures, on the education infrastructure, on, on the health infrastructures, um, uh, in terms of um, or creating orphans who become, un you know, who are essentially unsocialized, um, you know, what the potential and uh, problems that that might create longer term, the impacts on food security and, and the interconnectedness of HIV AIDS with food insecurity and, and the, the, the impact that HIV AIDS has on the ability to, to, for people to feed themselves. Um, the, the task force, I think, also served and has served and continues to serve as an as important platform to bring leaders from the frontline states, we call them, here into Washington. Oftentimes, Washington policy is made in something of a vacuum without a great deal of reference to opinions from people on the ground. And when I say leaders, not just governmental leaders, but leaders in the public health realm and so forth. Uh, our reports tend to be very short. I brought a couple here. This is one we did on Nigeria, one on Russia. 
timely. We, we issue a number of them over the year, but they're not big tomes. They're meant to be digestible and readable by policymakers who have notoriously short uh, attention spans. Um, in the second phase of the task force, we focused, we were joined by our Russian Eurasia program, Celeste Wallander, some of you may know, and uh, Sarah Mendelssohn lead that, by our China program, our India program. And we put a special emphasis on the second wave states, um, these big populous states where prevalence is still relatively low, where the leadership hadn't really uh, mobilized or acknowledged the potential threat, uh, and where the big, uh, big challenges in prevention lie, and where the, where the epidemic was still largely contained within high-risk populations who, um, unlike in the first wave of states in Southern Africa where it's a generalized population, and everybody to a certain extent sees that they're at risk, uh, in these countries where it's, it's uh, confined largely to high-risk populations who are criminalized, marginalized, and not considered uh, important by a large portion of the population. Uh, the U.S. strategy had primar principally been focused at that point on the high prevalence, con prevalence countries, and uh, the PEPFAR initiative was heavily weighted uh, towards treatment. Um, but there was this l large looming problem of low prevalence countries where the potential to grow was, was enormous, but no real thinking about how the U.S. could engage China or Russia or India. Uh, the bilateral relationships were so complex and so broad, HIV AIDS tended to fall by the wayside on those. Um, and so in the second phase, our big emphasis was putting together senior delegations, not enormous delegations, but very senior, uh, concentrated groups uh, who traveled to India, to Russia, to China, uh, to Nigeria and Ethiopia, uh, most recently to Vietnam, uh, which interestingly is the only PEPFAR country which, in which the epidemic is primarily fueled by injecting drug use. And, and that's not something that uh, the U.S. had really grappled with and hasn't really grappled with here in, at home but definitely hadn't figured out how to engage uh, countries um, with the injecting drug use uh, issue. Um, the delegations are, um, tend to be a mix of people. Again, congressional staff, public health experts, uh, corporate representatives, often from the pharmaceutical industry, and those who may not have long time experience in HIV AIDS, but who have a strong voice in Washington on foreign policy or strategic issues and be, can become champions uh, or advocates for the, uh, the report's findings and recommendations among their peers. And I think that was really one of the tasks we saw, was getting some of the folks who, uh, from kind of the more traditional security and strategy environment, who really didn't take this uh, perhaps so seriously or didn't weigh on, on their radar of, of, of strategic issues. and get them to kind of see what was happening on the ground. Uh, I think th this has been, I think, a very effective way of getting people mobilized, and not just through CSIS, but I think much of U.S. activism on, uh, in, in the government on HIV AIDS comes from these people visiting uh, towns. You get a much better sense of reality when you're, when you're talking to a sex worker who she never dreamed that she would be doing this work, but she has children to feed and she has no other opportunities for work. Um, or you talk to a, uh, a drug user in Russia who's, you know, 20 years old and has really lost hope for any kind of a meaningful future, I think that really s kind of shatters uh, certain perceptions that people have and um, uh, kind of gives a new perception on things. Um, talking to a mother who can't afford the cost of, never, never mind of the drugs, but even if they're free, can't afford the cost of the transportation to the nearest village uh, and to the nearest clinic. Um, Seeing uh, the conditions on the ground in Vietnam's 05 and 06 centers, which are essentially uh, detention camps for uh, in, uh, drug users and commercial sex workers, uh, this gets the reality across, I think, in ways that briefings and uh, policy papers can't really do. And so oftentimes we find members of the delegations come back They've spent time with public health experts and so forth, much better informed, but much more energized and focused um, uh, to kind of take the issue up again in their institution, whether it's Congress, the administration, corporate, or so forth. Um, the hope, too, is that these delegations serve 
something uh, uh, of a benefit in the country themselves by giving profile to groups and profile and legitimacy uh, and moral support to those groups that are very active um, within the country but are often marginalized, um, whether it's health professionals, NGOs, or um, association of people living with HIV AIDS. Um, our Russia delegation I'll speak briefly about. I should say we, we have uh, these reports are available, all our reports are available online. Um, and but just as an example of that kind of work, um, Strobe Talbot, uh, head of the Brookings Institute, and John Hamry, who's head of uh, CSIS, uh, were, uh, led that delegation. Judith Twigg was a member as well. And John Hamry, he's concerned with HIV, but it's not something that really, you know, it, he, he doesn't have a depth of knowledge. And I think this really helped kind of shape his perceptions on that. Uh, but we came back with a kind of succinct set of findings and practical recommendations. The reports aren't intended to be compendiums on, on but kind of make some, some pointed uh, recommendations that, peop that policymakers can take up. Uh, in Russia, I mean, I'll skip over this because you can read it, and I'm, I, I gather that you've heard a lot about Russia already today, <laughs> today or in the past couple of days. But I want some of the key findings were, for example, the ambiguity and the uncertainty around the prevalence, the actual prevalence rates. Uh, you know, these are notoriously difficult to measure. Um, uh, but the fact that there was so much flexibility and, and a wide range of estimates made it makes it very difficult to mobilize um, political will around it because people can can say, well, th th that's you're being alarmist and so forth. So one of our principal recommendations there, for example, was for the U.S. to expand cooperation with Russia uh, to improve surveillance program and data management. Something very technical, but something and something that shouldn't stop activity on everything else, but to have to have that basic information in hand is, is absolutely key, I think, to, um, to building political response. Uh, another, the isolation of the AIDS response and the AIDS system and the AIDS centers from the general public health system. And here the recommendation was more that the U.S. should find ways to expand and accelerate training for medical professionals across the board, Russian medical professionals across the board, uh, so that th this isn't confined in this parallel system where people feel stigmatized to go and, and it doesn't make the necessary connections between um, the other health, uh, other health issues. Uh, far greater support needed to go to the non-governmental sector. This doesn't mean that all our recommendations are taken up, um, especially those groups working with high-risk populations. One of the greatest difficulties in these second wave states is is this uh, problem of tr how, how do you reach high risk groups who are stigmatized or criminalized, uh, men who have sex with men, commercial sex workers, IDUs, prison populations, uh, seen as they're seen as social evils or uh, maladapted or what have you. And reaching them comes into conflict with public security concerns and political sensitivities. And I should say, you know, it's very easy for us to go to other countries and say, well, certainly you have to, you have to, uh, you know, be talking to commercial sex workers and IDUs, and you need to have condom distribution in the schools and education for young girls. But the fact is, we have so many political sensitivities here about those very same issues that uh, we have to be fairly careful there. Uh, Russia was probably among the most politically sensitive for the delegations, and I, I wasn't on the gr group, but you know, I traveled to, uh, to Nigeria and to Ethiopia. I think where the, the epidemic is a given. I think in Russia there's still such a great deal of denial, and there were those in the government who, you know, and outside, who recognized the potential threat, who were looking and eager for partners um, and partnerships with external actors. Uh, but I think there's other very powerful voices who, and it goes a little bit to kind of the, what the senator was talking about, who see this as really unwarranted external interference, alarmist, HIV AIDS, uh, it's a problem, but it's not our, it's not our primary problem. Uh, it doesn't happen to normal people, it happens to injecting drug users uh, and uh, men who have sex with men, uh, you know, it, so, so, I mean, and, I mean, what's interesting is that it was a little bit the same attitude that the, that the United States and pretty much every country has gone in when it was confined to uh, men who have sex with men, 
uh, gay men here, it was seen as a Haitian problem, and, and it, it took a long time for the leadership to come around. It's just a shame that every single country has to go through that same denial um, uh, phase. And, um, CSIS doesn't do a lot of primary research um, or data collection, but I should say that Sarah Mendelson has done some really interesting survey and focus group work uh, among uh, Russian health professionals and their attitudes towards HIV. And again, you go in thinking, well, surely they will, they will understand the scope and the threat and, and the problem. But the fact is that there was huge variation in how much of a threat they saw it. Oftentimes, it's a problem, yeah, but it's not our biggest health problem. Our biggest, you know, we have a crumbling public health system. Doctors aren't paid enough. We can't get even your, your basic, um, basic supplies and so forth. Um, and I think, you know, this says that maybe engaging head-on on HIV AIDS is going to be particularly difficult in, in Russia. Uh, but there may be kind of si a side door. You can come in through the, the, through the uh, health infrastructure uh, strengthening and so forth. Um, although I should say, and it goes somewhat to your point, the focus, to focus too much on the health infrastructure I think um, uh, is difficult because particularly in these low prevalence states, uh, and in, in fact anywhere where prevention has to be a priority, so much of prevention takes place outside of the health infrastructure. And you need, you need the understanding of local cultures, lo local mores, lo uh, what changes people's behavior, who they listen to, and so forth. Just to finish up, <laughs> am I going on too long? All right. <laughs> the task force right now is looking at issues kind of going forward of sustainability, moving from this emergency response, very treatment focused, on how, how to move to something that is long term more sustainable. Questions of infrastructure resource sustainability, health personnel capacity, how to address, you know, how you can develop systems that can kill uh, two birds with one stone. Gender committees looking at how to integrate HIV with reproductive health systems, uh, how to build on existing capacity. Uh, we have a prevention committee that uh, uh, is chaired by Jen Cates at the Kaiser Foundation and Phil Nieberg. Um, and the premise there is that prevention in all of this is, is being put at risk. So much emphasis on treatment it's politically more palatable to, to help sick people, uh, and it's you know a moral imperative as well. Uh, it's very hard to measure how effective prevention interventions are. It's hard to say, oh, we prevented 50,000 uh, infections. It goes to that. What's effective? How do you measure it? Uh, and then, of course, there's all the ideological gr gridlock here in Washington, D.C. around abstinence. So how do you expand what we mean by prevention? Uh, uh, and uh, and so forth. So I'm wrapping up very quickly. It is politically sensitive in Washington and across the world. We are bipartisan and centrist, but we, we try not to pull our punches and we don't shy away from kind of the difficult, divisive issues. I think a lot is uh, in the tone of the reports, trying to be balanced, to keep the tone constructive and dispassionate, acknowledging progress where there is, but um, also highlighting uh, challenge challenges and finding common ground. Thank you. Um, Robert has told me he needs 25 minutes, but he's going to try to speak in five because we do have security issues in the, in the building and, and we really can't stay in here too much longer than uh, maybe another 15, 20 minutes. So. With that in mind, there's some routine security. Not that there's been a threat, right? No, no, this is routine. No, this is routine. Um, I'm going to try to present in a very short period of time about three and a half years worth of data collection and analysis. Um, one of my colleagues who participated in this, Kevin, is in the back. He can leave now. He's heard all of this before. Um, basically, oh, oh, great. Well, this was on a Mac two hours ago. Getting it to PC is going to cause all sorts of trouble. But briefly speaking, the difference between the HIV epidemic in the United States and Russia is that Russia is an epidemic concentrated in injection drug users. In some locations, HIV seroprevalence in drug users is higher than it is anywhere in the United States at this point. And prevention programs, it, with one or two exceptions, are virtually non-existent in Russia, despite now a decade of the epidemic. Uh, this was supposed to be a graph that shows you how rapidly it's gone up. 
you can see how, how effective a PC is at conveying information the Mac would convey with no trouble at all. But basically, you've gone from 1,000 infections in 1995 to 325,000 infections, registered infections at the end of last year, whatever you think about the data. It's nevertheless a hideous epidemic, concentrated 80 to 85 percent among drug injectors. And among the factors that have been associated, unique features of the Russian epidemic are this use of homemade drugs, especially homemade heroin and methamphetamine. And some studies have actually linked homemade drug use to increase HIV prevalence. And if you get a good look at this picture for life, you can see how black and awful this stuff is. And no one in their right mind would want to inject it into their veins, but they do it on a regular basis. And because of this, you know, this epidemic has been so rapid, there's all this information and invocation of unusual causes of this epidemic. Homemade drug occasionally has been linked with anecdotal reports of blood inside the, the drugs, drug blood being used during the manufacture of these drugs. That led to the belief that these drugs themselves are contaminated and, of course, then to a denigration of standard prevention programs. If the drugs themselves are transmitting the virus, then giving clean needles to drug injectors will have no protective effect. Why bother doing it? So we set up a research study funded by the National Institute on Drug Abuse with two hypotheses. One was that HIV contaminated drug preparations contribute to the unique features of the epidemic because the drug preparations are, in fact, potentially infectious. That's hypothesis. Second hypothesis is that somehow homemade drug use throughout Russia is linked to the epidemic because of the social nature in which these drugs are used, done in people's homes, in people's kitchens, in groups. And going through this quickly, you can see that this is a very social and a sort of kitchen production of manufacturing homemade heroin called Chernaya, black in Russian because you saw the color of the stuff in the syringe. Um, Kevin took these pictures. Uh, this was where? Uh, Kazan. Uh, the the poppies, uh, poppies are ground up. The liquid's extracted uh, in a aqueous solution. It's, a, it's uh, mixed with some organic acids, boiled down, uh, mixed with, in a variety of steps, with uh, uh, acetic anhydride to turn the morphine that's in it into heroin. It's filtered, refined down, mixed with a variety of things, in this case, uh, dimidrol, which is an antihistamine to make it, uh, I don't know, increase the effectiveness. It's then, it can be injected, takes a couple of hours to manufacture this, and it can either be used immediately or stored for later use. So how does HIV enter this? Sometimes blood is used during some of the final steps to get rid of the impurities because you're grinding up a plant product. Um, so what we did was take the work that was done in the field, this ethnographic work, and um, develop for the laboratory use, I'm a biologist by training, a, um, a prototypical Tronaya production protocol. We actually got a license from the US uh, DEA to be able to do this in our laboratory, and then we replicated the process using HIV-infected blood here in the laboratory, uh, training ethnographers, in, the, in this case on the left, to be laboratory rats. Um, not injecting them with it, but just to be laboratory scientists. <laughs> um, so what's the effect of adding blood during the manufacture? Um, what we did was add HIV-infected blood while we were making this up in the places where it had been reported to be used. And what we found is that while we could recover HIV from syringes infected with blood in all of the cases when we didn't introduce this Chornaya into the syringe but used just a, a solution of, of water, we found that the Chornaya itself reduced HIV and no way augmented it. Um, before I get to that, because I'm rushing through this, I forgot the most important part. When we added the, the blood itself to the virus during production, we could never, ever, in 11 of our uh, independent preparations, recover any viable HIV from this production. The production of homemade heroin, even when HIV blood is included, results in the inactivation of HIV. The conditions are just too harsh for the virus to survive. But because this can be done in people's kitchens and a communal thing, it could be possible that blood could be transmitted or or HIV could be transmitted in infected blood inside the syringes that are shared in the households of these people who are injecting. So we tested syringes as well in this experiment with syringes. Now I'm back to this. Um, 
we compared the effect of what simulating a syringe sharing episode with the Chornaya or with just a, a regular drug solution made up from commercial heroin. In this case, with the commercial heroin, all of the syringes had the potential to remain infectious, whereas when, the, when it was Chornaya that was being shared in the syringe, there was a huge reduction. Only 19% of the syringes remained potentially infectious. So in some ways, this material may actually be protective for, and reduce the likelihood of HIV transmission. Uh, some people think this is counterintuitive. How can you get an epidemic when, in fact, you're protecting against the epidemic? That's the next excellent question. Um, in our study, in which we interviewed nearly 1,000 injectors in, in 11 cities, what was interesting is five of those cities, this homemade heroin production still predominated. In six of the cities, commercial heroin predominated, had been generally replaced. It's generally an either-or phenomenon. Either you've got commercial heroin there and people use it, or you've got this homemade drug there and people use it. We found no difference in the, in the prevalence of risky injection practices, injection behaviors, uh, being in being, I guess, being in prison, uh, other experiences with police that might uh, have some social impact on HIV transmission. The biggest differences in HIV prevalence were absolutely associated with the higher rates in the cities where heroin predominated. I'll show you this in this graph here. The homemade cities routinely rank low in prevalence. This is the HIV prevalence rates according to Russian federal statistics, and you can see the rates are low in the homemade, in the cities where homemade drug predominates, and high as much as tenfold higher or more in the cities where commercial heroin predominates. There are a couple of interesting exceptions that are as interesting as the general pattern. One is Yaroslavl, a city where commercial heroin predominates but still has a very low HIV prevalence. That's because they started uh, harm reduction programs back in 1997 before the epidemic really took off. The other interesting exception is Chapayesk. The HIV prevalence is for the oblast as a whole, uh, Samar Oblast. Chapayesk is a small city in which the homemade drug still predominates. The big cities in Samar Oblast, Samara and Tolyadi, have seen this transition to commercial heroin. They're the cities with very high HIV uh, prevalence among injection drug users, Chapayesk is the city itself has a pretty low level, but if you look at it at statistics at the oblast level, it artificially pushes this city from sort of up around here down to looking as though it's, a, it's a, an anomaly, but it's not. It's an anomaly because of being a small city in a large oblast. So, conclusions. We'll get right to them. Homemade drugs are unlikely to have contributed to the HIV epidemic in Russia. In fact, they've probably slowed it down. The virus itself does not survive the manufacturing process. The frequency of this practice is therefore irrelevant since HIV is inactivated by the harsh manufacturing. And the storage of homemade drugs as liquids in contaminated syringes or the use of, of contaminated syringes to share in, in this drug and inject it um, is likely to have very little transmission effect because HIV, HI, HIV viability is reduced by contact with the homemade heroin preparations. It is the replacement of homemade drugs by commercial heroin that's the important factor in the epidemic. Um, so the ramifications from the standpoint of how this should impact policy, the HIV epidemic in Russia did not result from contaminated drugs. This thing that's in the literature without any evidence is, um, you know, is spurious. It, you know, harm reduction measures that have been effective elsewhere in the world should be effective in Russia. And our next working hypothesis is to get more data to demonstrate more, more, with more statistical power that the transition from homemade to commercial heroin is actually linked directly to the explosive HIV epidemic. Uh, thanks. Thank you. We have time. I, I think what we'll do is see if we have a couple of questions. Maybe the other panels can join us back up here. We have time for a couple of questions if they're short and quick, and I think we'll try to collect questions. Um, we haven't given the audience a lot of opportunity to speak up, so this is this will be it. Are there any questions? Cindy. If we've got time, one issue that didn't come up as 
much is really reflected in, sorry about that, in the title for the workshop about, I'm going to look at Setne's workshop thing now, about social welfare systems and citizenship. Because we, one of the things that seems to come up um, in all three, or especially in the first three um, comments, is this idea about the role of the state and the assumption. And when you look at Brazil in particular, Brazil had a long history of assuming that the state was responsible for providing health care. And the state actually could be an active actor in pharmaceutical production, not just private industry. And so the su success of Farmanguinhos really does fly in the face of the structural adjustment programs that you, you talked about. And so I wondered if, in kind of some closing remarks, if we could kind of unpack that issue of citizenship a little bit more, because it does hit to the heart of what you were talking about, Craig, in terms of the overlap with social science concerns. Let me just see, are there any other questions? Is it going to be a short question? Uh, yes. Uh, this is for Craig Calhoun. Uh, you mentioned the significance of, inequ of social inequality in the spread of, of HIV. Uh, comparing South Africa and Botswana, they both have very high uh, rates of HIV. They both have labor migration. But I'm wondering, while South Africa is one of the most in, e, unequal societies in the world, uh, how, does Botswana have the same level of it? I don't, I don't think so. So what's the explanation for, for both having these sky-high rates, actually, in, I think, in your opinion? Okay, I, I actually think these questions are somewhat related. So I think, I think what I'm, I will do is we'll turn to Craig first, uh, and then we'll just move down the panel. To wrap up. Okay, um, being really <laughs> brief before our security problems get us. Um, I think Cindy's absolutely right, both that we didn't attend to that part of the theme as much and that it's very important. Um, it's partly this issue of citizenship and the role of the state overlap. They're not exactly the same thing. Um, the, a first issue is simply state capacity. Um, and that includes the capacity of the healthcare delivery systems and especially the public healthcare delivery systems. Um, but a second issue is um, state will um, to pursue this and um, the uh, determination to have this reach beyond relatively privileged and well served populations. And here I think another factor is social movement mobilization. And so the um, existence of social movement mobilization is a big factor in getting those states that have state capacity to, in fact, use it. Um, it doesn't do as much where the states don't have state capacity in the first place. Um, social movement mobilization has been very disproportionately um, fueled by um, gay male populations. So those, so. One of the interesting features of this is that there's a discussion, this is, oh, that was all, it really didn't, you know, only weird places like the United States where this was really a gay men's disease and it's really about other things. There's an element of truth, right? This really is largely a heterosexual female disease in much of the world. And there's something misleading because of the pivotal role that highly mobilized gay populations have played in demanding attention and action to the disease in a variety of settings um, around the world, including in Brazil. Um, where this was, was really pivotal. A third thing about it, uh, briefly, is this issue of stigmatized populations, which multiple people, including the center, have mentioned with regard to um, Russia and Eurasia more generally. Um, to the extent that the epidemic is seen as contained in stigmatized populations, and I stress that that may or may not be because it is entirely contained in those populations, um, then there is a particular um, challenge for getting a public response because this sort of disqualifies those stigmatized populations as citizens in a way. And, and so it doesn't, the welfare of regimes oriented towards respectable citizens don't apply to these less respectable citizens. My own, I'm not a specialist on um, any part of, of Eurasia. My own impressions of, of Russia are that 
that the um, stigmatization is in excess of the reality and more so all the time. That is, the public health campaigns, the subway signs that are all about it's just prostitutes and drug users, which convey the message, don't worry. It's, it, I mean, that they're supposed to be conveying the message, worry, but they're really the, the, the latent message is don't worry because it's only those bad people are um, misleading because this probably is more into the general population than that would suggest, although I don't know that deeply. The inequality question is related to this because it, it does, um, it is one more factor that bears on the way in which public health and citizenship work, but I think not in a simple way. And my point of citing that with farmers that I think there is evidence that the pandemic is um, um, exacerbated, not produced by, but exacerbated by both A, poverty, and B, inequality but neither of those is a unidimensional cause. So the, the comparison between Botswana and South Africa, I'd say the real point here is there is, it's not a single variable. You can't explain this entirely by inequality. The, the point of mentioning it is that, that this won't do that work. In that particular case, um, the, the big common factor is labor migration of various kinds, um, and there are a variety of different um, versions of this from long distance truck routes to mine workers to this and that and rural urban um, disparities, which are part of the inequality that produces a high level of migration and displacement of male populations um, who will then use commercial sex workers. And so having men working away from their original place of residence is a huge predictor, and that's common to South Africa and um, Botswana. The inequality rates are different. Botswana has, is in a, a in its region, relatively low inequality, but by no means low inequality globally because of the, the rural-urban differences, which are huge. Jennifer, any final observations? Sure, just on, on the Botswana case, it goes to both of these because it's really an anomaly. I mean, Botswana has this very open democratic leadership that has been very galvanized on HIV AIDS for some time, one of the most uh, broadest responses. And compared to some of its neighbors, it's higher income. and. I think uh, Botswanans themselves are um, puzzled by this. I mean, there's a lot of theories. One, that um, because they're so, they have somewhat more disposable income, they might be liable to have more multiple um, uh, partners. Um, men may, pe many people have homes in the towns. They also have homes in the village, but they also have homes on the ranch. Um, and so that they're much more mobile that way, plus plus that factor. Some of the some of the issues have to, you know, some of the hypotheses are cultural practices and the really really subordinate position of woman, which uh, is somewhat acute in Botswana, in um, according to the Botswanans I talked to. But um, it is an anomaly, and there's probably other factors that we just haven't even discovered yet. Um, there's just a whole growing body of evidence, uh, for example, on the effect that circumcision has on reducing HIV transmission. Um, something I think that, you know, why hasn't it taken off in West Africa as it has in Southern Africa? Well, that, that th according to that theory, the circumcision rates are much lower in West Africa. And this is fairly solid and growing body of evidence. It kind of reminds me of this homemade versus commercial heroin. I would never have really... Uh, factor that in. I mean, I don't know the topic, but there's probably things that we're not looking at that, that can account for it. Um, so Botswana makes a fascinating case, but um, I think points to the larger issue of every, every place and even microcultures within, within countries, um, each has a different driver and different factors that are, are uh, driving this. Anything to add? I'm not sure I can add much to this discussion except just to think of it from the standpoint of my 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 own country where um, successful demonization of the people who are most affected by illness only results in the illness getting out of hand rather than the illness being under control and if that's the social response to disease I guess we can't expect much more than being always in an emergency situation to respond to uh, to health threats instead of being in control of them. On that note, I want to thank uh, all the panelists. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with this building, at 6 o'clock you can get out, but you can't get back in this part of the building. So be sure to take everything you want 
to take with you if you leave after 6 o'clock. Thank you. Or else you're stuck. Pardon? Or else you're stuck. <laughs>